Hi, in this video, we'll help you with your first steps with Adobe Substance 3D Designer. Substance 3D Designer is a little bit different from other Adobe applications. Its main purpose is to create shapes, patterns, and materials in an efficient, non-destructive way using nodes and graphs. You chain together these nodes, they re represent an action, and you modify, expand, and create your result like that. Unlike Illustrator or Photoshop, where you manually perform each action and making changes might require you to redo a lot of these steps, Designer lets you go back to any step of the process to make adjustments. Nothing is ever lost like this. You can iterate, modify details, and even change resolution on the fly. Designer can be a bit more complex at first glance, but the different windows of the UI each have a distinct purpose, and working together, they let you easily build graphs. Every project starts in the Explore window. It shows you the packages or files that you have open in Designer and lets you open the different pieces of content within these packages. The Explore window also lets you import and export your content easily. Designer's graphs, the networks of nodes that represent your work, are shown in the main graph window. It's here that you do the bulk of the work, adding, connecting, and moving nodes around. Anything you select in the Explorer or the Graph window has properties that let you modify its behavior. The Properties window on the right is context sensitive. It displays the properties of whatever you currently have selected. That can be a node, a graph, or any other resource. The two windows below the graph are the 3D and 2D windows. The 2D window displays the result of any node you double click on in the graph view. It lets you inspect and track the result of each node in your graph. The 3D window displays full, physically-based materials. If you're building a graph that creates multiple outputs, which together form a PBR material, the 3D view lets you visualize this. Unlike Substance 3D Sampler, Designer even lets you load up custom meshes in this window. Finally, there's the library window on the bottom left. It shows you all the default content you can use to build graphs. You can browse through to find useful shapes and noises, and then drag them as nodes to the graph view. Creating your first graph is easy. There are a few graph types, but mostly you'll create substance graphs. Click the new substance graph button, and we'll choose the empty graph preset. Let's give it a different name, and not worry about the resolution. We can always change that one later. Now let's add our first node. The easiest way, if you're just starting, is to browse the library thumbnails. Find the Generators category in the library and click on the Patterns subcategory. Scroll through the patterns until you find the Shape node. Drag it into your graph view to create your first node. Clicking on the node shows you its properties on the right side. To make it a bit easier, you can collapse the base parameters as well as the attributes. Going through the instance parameters, you'll notice the Pattern dropdown lets you choose a few different shapes. The scale slider lets you scale the shape uniformly. The size lets you change the proportions. Angle lets you rotate the shape. If you're unhappy with the change, you can always reset a value by clicking that little drop down next to the parameter name and choosing reset. Or you can click on a numerical value and type in precise numbers for more exact results. So we want to add a triangle shape as well, but we'll need another node for that. You can see the polygon node in the library. But let's try another method to add nodes. Press spacebar over your graph view to get access to a quick node searching menu. If we type in polygon, any matching results from the library are shown here. Click on polygon one to add it to the graph. Polygon has a property for the number of sides. Let's set that to three. There are other specific settings you can try out, but we'll just reduce the scale a bit to make it smaller. Now, we want to move our shapes around, and you'll notice both shape and polygon have no sliders for moving. We'll need a new node to transform them. These basic actions can be found in the library under Atomic Nodes. Atomic Nodes are also available on the top bar of the graph view, using their color codes and icons. They're also available through the spacebar hotkey. We'll search for Transform and add the Transformation 2D node then connect our triangle shape to it. Transform is similar to the tool in Photoshop. You can move, scale, and rotate the entire input connection. In Designer, Transform tiles or wraps your shape around the edges by default. We're just going to move our triangle to the left side. 
Now we want to combine our rectangle and triangle together to make a white arrow. Combining nodes is the most used action in Designer, and it's done with a node called Blend. It's easily available, second from the top in the spacebar menu, or you can drag it from the top node bar into the graph view. If we connect our two nodes up and zoom in, we get a clue of how the Blend node works. Just like blending two layers on top of each other, the Blend node has a foreground and a background element, as well as an optional opacity input. This opacity input is used as a mask to blend the foreground. The Blend node doesn't seem to do anything at first. That's because the blending mode is set to copy, which means the foreground simply replaces the background if there's no mask. We want to mix the two shapes, keeping the white from both. In the properties, let's change the blending mode to add. This adds all the white parts together, giving us our arrow shape. Let's go a bit further. To try out the iterative workflow of Designer, we want to change the solid triangle of the arrow into an outlined one. We can base that on the same triangle we created before. So let's add another transformation 2D below the first one and connect the triangle to it. We'll move it less far to the left than the first one to use it as a sort of cutting shape to hollow out the inside of the first triangle. Combining them is done by adding another blend node and connecting the two triangles. We'll need to change the blending modes, so let's set that to subtract. The result isn't what we want at first sight. That's because unlike with add, the order of the background and foreground matters. We can select the connections by dragging over them and hitting delete, and then reconnecting them in another order. This gives us the correct result. But even faster would have been to select the foreground and background connections and pressing the X key on your keyboard. This swaps the two selected connections around. It's a very useful hotkey when working with Blend. Now we can replace the connection of our solid triangle by the newly created outline shape. It looks like our rectangle isn't properly aligned yet. If you double click on the final Blend node, you see it in the 2D preview. Then single click on the rectangle node to only view its properties. This use of single and double click lets you tweak a basic node earlier in the chain while viewing the combined end result. We'll just play with the size and scale until things line up nicely. So far, you've learned some simple concepts in Designer, like adding nodes, transforming them, and combining them with Blend. But we've only worked with black and white shapes so far. This is another key concept. Working with black and white shapes tends to be simpler than with color. These black and white or grayscale shapes are used as masks or alphas when adding color. There are two main ways to add color. The first one uses our familiar blend node. We connect our arrow shape to the bottom opacity input to use it as a mask. Now, we need a node to add some actual color. The uniform color node can be found in the same areas or add it through the spacebar menu. It fills the entire image with the color you pick in its properties, so let's set it to a red tint. If we now connect it to the foreground, our arrow shape is used to mask out the red color. In the 2D view, transparency is shown as a checker pattern, just like Photoshop. We can toggle this transparency display with the Show Checkerboard button at the bottom of the 2D view. It shows us that we're actually blending our solid red color on top of a transparent black color. That means if nothing is connected to our blend background, it defaults to transparent black. But if we look closely, the edges of the red arrow have some black bleeding in because of this. Another method then is to not use blend, but just merge our shape in as an alpha. Through the spacebar menu, we can search for alpha. Let's add the alpha merge node. This node is a bit simpler. Connect a color and a grayscale input to combine them. There's no blending or anything. Our solid red color just gets a transparent alpha channel from our arrow shape. To finalize your work in a graph and make it usable elsewhere, you need to make a connection to a final output. Whatever you connect to an output node becomes usable as texture or connection. It's best to give outputs an identifying name in their attributes. We don't have to stick to one single output for our colored arrow. You can add more outputs if it's useful. Let's add a second output node and connect our grayscale arrow to it and rename the output to grayscale. 
you'll notice that each output becomes listed under the graph in the Explorer. Now let's move to creating a basic pattern. We'll create a new graph for that, again, choosing the empty template and renaming it to pattern one. New graphs created with this method are in a separate package each time, but you can move a graph between packages to organize them together. Then just close the resulting empty package without saving. To create our pattern, let's look through the nodes in the library. Near the bottom, we find the tile generator nodes. If we search through the spacebar menu, we see there's a regular, grayscale version of the node and a color version. This is common for many nodes in the library. Let's take a look at the difference while we build our pattern. We'll add the regular grayscale version to start. Tile generator tiles or repeats a single pattern in a grid. To give you full control, there are many parameters and it's easiest to collapse some of the rollouts to get an overview. To set the amount of patterns, you can change the X and Y amount parameters. You can change the pattern shape to a few default shapes or even a custom input image. You can modify the scale as well as randomize the scale for each single pattern. You can modify the position through an offset slider or with random X and Y positioning. You can even modify rotation or randomize the grayscale luminance. Now let, let's use that arrow shape we created before. By dragging and dropping a graph from the explorer into the graph view, it becomes a new node. This powerful principle lets you nest and reuse your work easily. If we look closely, we see the two outputs we created before. The color output is orange, telling us it carries color data, unlike the grayscale output. Connecting an orange color output to a grayscale input leads to an invalid red connection. We'll use the grayscale shape instead. This is why working in grayscale versus color is best separated and thought through. With the grayscale shape connected, we can set the pattern type to image input, telling the tile generator to use the connection we just plugged in. After that, we can customize the look of the pattern through the X and Y, the scale position and the angle sliders. If we decide to update or swap our shape, that's just a matter of placing a new node and replacing the connection. All relevant settings of the tile generator are kept. We can keep creating without having to redo any work. Now, we have a full grayscale pattern. Adding color to it is done just the same way we did before with alpha merge. Let's try the color version of the tile generator now to see the difference. We place a new tile generator color node and hook our color arrow connection to it. Then set the pattern to use image input. The background defaults to black, but with the color version of Tile Generator, you can turn that background into uh, transparent by going to the background color settings. We also want to have two colors of our arrow appear in this pattern. It's easy to adjust an existing color with the HSL node, standing for Hue Saturation Lightness Adjustment. If we plug our red arrow shape in, the Hue slider lets us modify the hue to green, giving us a second version of the arrow. If we jump into the pattern settings of the tile generator again, we can increase the number of inputs with the pattern input number slider. Connecting our green arrow to the new second slot gives us a pattern that randomly displays green or red arrows. To add more colors with the grayscale version of our pattern, we have to work a bit different. For example, we can create a transform 2D node and offset our original pattern slightly. If we then use alpha merge with a black color, we create a second black version of our pattern. Blending the red and black versions together gives us a sort of drop shadow effect. Because of the way we build things, we can go back to the original shape and modify it or change our pattern placement while the final result dynamically updates. So far, we've only scratched the surface, but this video is hopefully giving you a solid base understanding of working in Substance 3D Designer. Next, Let's learn about making and breaking up some more interesting shapes.